their posts online. All right. I'm going to pull the screen down and I would like to welcome members of the public and fellow staff and interested citizens. Uh, my name is Eddie Willis. I'm a planner for East Bay Regional Park District, and I'm really excited to share more with you about our um, initial planning efforts at the former Roddy Ranch Golf Course in Antioch, California. Some of you may know me from my many years of working um, just up the road at Black Diamond Mines Regional Preserve. I led hikes to the cemetery, did underground mine tours, and ran some of the school programming there. Um, but it moved over to planning, but I'm really excited to introduce you to uh, what will soon be one of our newest East Bay Regional Parks. Um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, um, Elena Miramar, and she is from uh, Vision Hispania newspaper, and she is here if anyone needs any Spanish language interpretation. So um, Elena, if you wouldn't mind saying a few words um, to everyone and introduce yourself. Sure, uh, thank you, Eddie. I'm uh, happy to be here. I am Elena Miramar, publisher of Vision Hispana newspaper. Uh, the newspaper has been serving the Hispanic community in the Bay Area since 2003. So I'm going to be here to help any, anyone who needs um, translation, anyone uh, the, or from the Spanish community who might need um, uh, translation in order to participate in this meeting. Ahora lo voy a repetir en español un poco. ¿Qué tal? Uh, buenas tardes. Soy Elena Miramar del periódico Visión Hispana. Y me complace estar aquí trabajando con el distrito de Parques del este de la bahía a fin de ayudar a que la, los parques sean más inclusivos y sean accesibles a todas las comunidades. Y estaré aquí para ayudar a cualquier persona que necesite o que requiera traducción al español para que puedan participar con preguntas y con dudas que tengan respecto al nuevo parque en Antioch. Gracias. Gracias, Eddie. Thank you. Um, I want to do a really quick run through of, of how to use the basic features of Zoom. Um, so for some of you folks who may be new to Zoom, others have been dealing with it for a year now. Um, but the basic features we have are at the bottom left of your screen, we have a mute and a stop video function. Um, I just ask that members of the audience, for the most part, if you could keep your microphone on mute and keep your video screen off. Um, we'll have a chance toward the end of the presentation to do, to do live um, audience discussion, uh, answer questions and so forth. Um, and we'll, of course our speakers will be able to unmute and show video of themselves. So that's one, there's also the chat box at the bottom center. We have a member of our staff dedicated to monitoring and answering chat questions. So if during the presentation, a thought comes to you, if you have a question, need some clarification, feel free to punch in an answer in the chat box. And you can also do it in Spanish. And if um, Elena can, can monitor that and help answer questions that might come in Spanish. Uh, another feature is we have reactions. So you can give thumbs up, clap, uh, do smiley faces. That's, that should be at the bottom of your screen. And then finally, if you click on the bar at the bottom that says participants, a box will pop up and you should have the ability to raise your hand. So toward the end, when we have live discussion, uh, we ask that you do the raise the hand feature. Another member of our staff uh, will call people as they raise their hands and we'll be able to help um, answer questions and facil facilitate discussion. All right. So the first thing I'd like to do is start um, a poll, and this will help us get to know our audience, um, where folks are coming from, what you're interested in. So I'm gonna launch a, a, an interactive poll. And while that is running, I'd like to turn it over to our local elected official, 
Um, his name is Colley, Colin Coffey, and he represents the part of the Park District that includes Roddy Ranch. Well, thank you, Eddie. Yeah, my name is Colin Coffey. I uh, uh, represent Ward 7 on the Board of Directors of the East Bay Regional Park District. Ward 7 covers uh, most of northern Contra Costa County and all of eastern Contra Costa County. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to uh, the first of these sessions of several. Uh, those familiar with the planning of the Marsh Creek Trail extension might recall that we uh, we did this, uh, I believe it was last year, we held several public input sessions to review with the public and get input on the plans for extending the Marsh Creek Trail. Uh, so it, it, we really appreciate uh, and, and on behalf of the Board of Directors want to thank you all for uh, attending this evening. I saw a couple of people I want to acknowledge and I'll keep my eye out for who's here, Eddie, in case uh, uh, one of our other local officials uh, attends. Uh, but I noticed Don Morrow is here from uh, Supervisor uh, Diane Burgess's office. Hi, Don. And Don is a uh, member of the Board of Directors of the Iron House Sanitary District. Thanks, Colin. Uh, and, Glad to be here. Thank you. And uh, Taylor Kimber, I think I, I saw Taylor. He's uh, representing Congressman Mark DeSaunier. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Ah, thank you. And uh, we've got our eye out for a couple of uh, uh, local officials from Antioch, and I'll, I'll just keep my eye out for that. Uh, with that, Eddie, I'll give it back to you, and perhaps you could also introduce some of uh, the Park District staff uh, attending tonight. Absolutely. Thank you, Colin. Um, so we have a, a number of folks um, on the on the call with us tonight. And um, I won't be able to name everybody uh, representing the Park District, but some of our core staff are Devin Reef, he's our principal planner and, um, and my supervisor. He's helping me uh, steer this project in planning for Roddy Ranch. Uh, we've got Brian Holt, our chief of planning GIS and trails. We have Erdem uh, Dragunalu. Uh, Erdem, I hope I got that right. Uh, he's our administrative analyst and he helps um, with our department. Um, we've met Colin Coffey, our, our local director, Rex Caulfield, park supervisor for Black Diamond Mines, as well as uh, currently for Roddy Ranch. And then um, the unit manager for the area, park unit manager, Terry Noonan. Um, we also have representatives from Restoration Design Group here, and we'll meet them later, as well as Abby Fateman, and she is from the East County Habitat Conservancy. Um, so welcome one and all. I'm gonna give the, the live poll a couple more minutes. Um, it looks like a few folks are still answering some questions. All right, so in the meantime, I'm gonna pull up the agenda for tonight. And hopefully everyone can see that. I'm gonna put it in the full screen mode. Okay, and if that looks good, can a few folks give me a thumbs up? Okay, that sounds great. So what we're gonna do is uh, just a moment, we'll go through the poll results. We have a, a formal presentation for you. I'm going to uh, begin the presentation and then I'm going to turn it over to our consultants who have been doing a lot of the groundwork at Roddy Ranch. And they will give us um, some of the background information, some of their discoveries, what we're working with out there. Um, and then at the end, we will have a chance for you to answer some chat questions. So we're starting with a poll initially, and then you'll be able to answer some more open ended chat questions as a way to participate. And then we'll open it up at 7.10 um, or thereabouts for a more formal audience discussion. We are scheduled to officially end at 7.30, but depending on participation and how interested folks are, and if we have a lot of questions, uh, we are happy to go um, until about eight o'clock or so. Um, so we're happy to stick around and answer any more questions. So I am gonna go ahead and end the poll. And I apologize in advance for any folks who 
we're still doing it. But I want to share the results so hopefully folks can see this on the screen. Give us a sense of uh, what we're doing out there in the world. All right, so have you been to any of these East County Regional Parks or Trails in the last year? It looks like most folks have answered they've been to Black Diamond Mines. Um, looks like a close second would be Contra Loma right next door, followed by Big Break, followed by Round Valley, followed by Antioch Oakley Shoreline, and down the line. All right. Just interested in where folks are coming from. Um, a lot of folks from Antioch, that's great. Brentwood, Oakley, general East Contra Costa County, folks from outside of East County. Uh, which of these outdoor activities do you enjoy? It looks like hiking is a very popular one, followed by relaxing, that's great. Um, picnicking, art and photography, road biking, mountain biking, jogging, birding, equestrian. Um, all great outdoor activities. How would you likely get to Roddy Ranch? Um, looks like by car or motor vehicles, number one, bicycle or walking. All right, and finally, have you visited Roddy Ranch before? Most people say no. Quite a few people said they've been there when it was a golf course and a handful of people had been there before it was a golf course. This is great. Okay, so I'm gonna move through the presentation at this point. All right, again, welcome. This is a, our first public meeting about the former Roddy Ranch Golf Course and our plans to develop a habitat restoration and public access plan. Okay, we will start with location. Roddy Ranch is located at the south end of Antioch, just within Antioch city limits. The way you would get there is by heading south on Deer Valley Road or heading west on Balfour. And when it was a, a golf course, some of you had been there when it was a golf course, you would drive up Tour Way and there's a, a staging area. And our project focus is on the 230 acres that make up the former golf course. It's nested inside of the larger swath of land that we're calling the future um, Deer Valley Regional Park or Regional Preserve. That's about 3,500 acres. Uh, we haven't begun the planning um, stages for that yet. Uh, we're starting with Roddy Ranch Golf Course, but um, it's right next to Black Diamond and just down the road is Round Valley. I would like to turn it over, Abby, if you're available, if you wanna say a few words about the East Contra Costa County Habitat Conservancy um, for folks at home who, who either don't know much about it or may not have heard of it, I'll let you take it from there. Uh, sure. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Um, well, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Abby Fateman. I am the executive director of the East Contra Costa County Habitat Conservancy. And my agency works with East Bay Regional Park District to conserve land in the East Contra Costa County region. Um, and my agency is focused on habitat restoration uh, that's focused on creating habitat and conserving habitat for special status and endangered species in the region. Um, we collaborate with the Park District on land, land acquisition, habitat restoration, and, and planning recreation that's compatible with habitat restoration and conservation as well. So I'm very excited to see this process kicking off. This is a, this is a really exciting project, and I'm, I'm glad you're all here uh, to engage um, and hope you stay involved with this uh, as we move through the process. Okay, great. Thank you, Abby. So yeah, on this map we have, um, we've partnered with the East County, East Contra Costa County Habitat Conservancy um, to date to preserve about just over 14,000 acres of open space, primarily from the hills uh, of Concord and Pittsburgh, south toward Vasco Road. Uh, so around Vasco Caves and Roddy Ranch um, is almost right in the middle of that large swath of land. And um, as habitat um, as habitat land, uh, there are going to be some restrictions on how much recreation we can we can propose within these lands, um, and and so forth. And we'll go into more detail about that as we move through the presentation. So that's a look at uh, General East Contra Costa County, All right? 
A little bit of history about the site. Uh, for millennia, this, this has been the homeland for the Bolvan people, um, for, for speakers of Bay Miwok, um, the original inhabitants of most of Contra Costa County. Um, so we're very close to um, Bolvan um, home territory. Um, in the 1830s, uh, just east of the Roddy Ranch site was the Rancho Los Meganos. And that was uh, started as a, a Mexican rancho or ranch and was eventually purchased by John Marsh who built uh, a large home. So if you're from the Brentwood area, you may be familiar with uh, the story of John Marsh. And that was in the 1830s. Many of you know that coal was discovered just north of what is today the Roddy Ranch Golf Course. And that opened up the Black Diamond Mines um, area. And throughout much of the 19th through 21st century, uh, this part of East County was mostly ranch lands and grazing. Uh, moving further along the historic timeline, in the 1970s, the, the Roddy family purchased about 2,000 acres at the south end of Antioch and opened up what was collectively called, or owned what was collectively called Roddy Ranch. And Mr. Roddy had a golf course built there. Um, which operated from the early 2000s until 2016. It closed and the East Bay Regional Park District purchased the land along with the Habitat Conservancy in 2018. And we began the planning process for the park um, starting last year, uh, formal planning. Uh, many of you may be wondering, what is the process that a park goes through from its uh, from its acquisition to finally opening to the public, we have four main um, phases that we go through. The first is acquisition where we get the property. Typically it remains in land bank status until it's made safe for public access. Right now we are early in the planning process, which is the second phase. Once we're done with planning, uh, it moves on to design and construction. And then everyone's favorite phase is operation. And that's when the park is open, it's being um, managed day to day by park staff. We have, uh, we allow recreational uses and so forth. And so um, this process can take years. We expect that the planning process will wrap up within about a year. We'll go into a little bit more detail when we get into the timeline later on. All right, some of the work we've been doing out there the last couple of years, a lot of it has been grassland restoration and weed abatement. So you can imagine um, a golf course that's regularly watered. And when you turn off the water, what happens? It, it dries out and every imaginable weedy plant grows up in its place. So a couple of years ago, a lot of the cart paths were covered with thorny weeds and through uh, grazing and integrated pest management techniques, IPM, we've been able to uh, reduce the weedy plant population. Uh, a couple more before and after photos here. All right, these are our overarching goals for the Roddy Ranch site, um, the 230 acre former golf course. Um, we have some basic restoration goals to restore grasslands, to enhance wetlands where it's appropriate. And we have recreation goals, of course, to open the park, to open the former golf course as a park, uh, to repurpose the, the cart paths and the trails and make connections to other regional parks and, and other parks in the area while supporting a, a diversity of outdoor activities. All right, so in 2020, we hired Restoration Design Group to do a lot of the, um, the initial planning work at Roddy Ranch. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Eric and he's gonna give us um, a run through with our existing conditions out there, uh, basically what we're working with. So take it away, Eric. Oh, and, I define mute. There you go. Patience. All right. Um, so I assume everyone can see my screen. Uh, and thank you, uh, Eddie, for the introduction. Um, my name is Eric Stromberg. I work at Restoration Design Group. I'm uh, the principal landscape architect at the firm and the project manager for the consultant team in this project. 
And I really have to say that we are very grateful to work on such an amazing project. The site is, um, as we're getting to know it, is pretty remarkable. Some of you may know it well already. Um, we've, we've known it from a distance for a while. It's really nice to spend this time to, to get on the site and, uh, and kind of learn more about it and what the potential of the site is. So one, one thing I wanna mention up front is where we are in the process. So we're very early on in the, in the planning phase, so much so that we really just completed the assessment. So that's what I'm talking about today is, uh, is a series of assessments which you see here. We just um, published the existing conditions report, which you can download from the park district and read in more detail than I'll probably cover today. Um, but uh, it is a, uh, uh, we're at a nice stage now where we have a really good understanding of, um, uh, of the site and it's starting to inform potentially what we'll do with uh, different concepts. So uh, the next phase after you know, this meeting, we get public feedback, we're going to start looking at uh, different alternatives for public access and restoration on site. So we're not there yet, um, but we're excited uh, to get there and I think we've got a nice uh, uh, basis to go off of. So. Uh, let me start actually by doing a, uh, a little video. It'll probably be a little choppy for everybody, um, but uh, it's a little drone photo that shows a little bit of what's out there today. So here you can see um, obviously the existing cart paths uh, and a lot of the fairways and golf, uh, uh, even the, not only the fairways, but also some of the sand traps. Um, we're looking there towards a, uh, a pond and now back a little bit east. Uh, and here we're kind of approaching the old clubhouse and parking area, which looks like it'll be a great spot for the staging area. Um, and then the next shot is uh, a little bit higher looking back towards Diablo. So there are some locations which I'll explain later. We have nice little peekaboo views of Diablo. I'll, I'll give you more of a, uh, a tour at the end of the uh, presentation, but I thought it'd be helpful to kind of see that now for folks who haven't had a chance to get on site. So uh, the first thing I'll do is kind of start with a few of these site level observations, and then I'll kind of move into more of a uh, three different zones that we've started to think about the site and what, what uh, different options can be made within these different zones. And the first thing uh, I think is kind of interesting to talk about is that when the golf course was uh, put in, it uh, really only uh, affected about um, three quarters of the site. So about a quarter of the site was preserved. Uh, and here you can see uh, uh, the 2017 aerial that shows the golf course itself. Um, and let me just spend a little bit of time orienting you because I have a number of images that are more or less this extent that show different information. Can I help? Um, yeah, and so we have, oh, let me go back. Somebody actually looks like they may not be muted. I don't know who that is. Um, so uh, let me orient you a little bit. We have Empire Mine Road at the very top of the site. And then as Eddie mentioned, to get onto the site, the, we get on from Deer Valley Road, which is just off the map on the right. And then you would drive, walk, or bike uh, up the, what is just kind of clipping in and out of this image. And this is what's currently called Tour Way. And then that takes you to uh, the existing parking lot, which serviced the golf course and the clubhouse at that time. Uh, clearly in this photo, you can see remnants of the golf course. You can see the golf cart paths. You can see some of the sand traps. If you look very carefully, you can even see some of the fairways. This is a taken about a year after the golf course actually closed, but clearly it's, uh, it's uh, a, lot of it, a lot of it is still there and visible. Uh, now, if we go way back in time to the earliest aerial we can find, it's actually about 80 years ago from 1939. Uh, I love these because you can really get a sense of uh, where the site has been and from a restoration standpoint, it's always nice to know um, where the site was and where it is today and potentially where it will go in the future. Uh, a couple things to point out with this uh, image is that uh, the site is primarily grasslands and it was historically. Clearly at this point in time, there was already a history of grazing, so it's not, uh, it hasn't been unaffected by uh, ranching. Um, but it, this is pretty similar to um, probably what it's looked like for quite a while. Although if you look very carefully, if you have good eyes, you can see that there's some erosion in some of these drainages. And that is um, very common uh, after kind of intensive grazing in these uh, soils, which we'll get into a little bit later. So um, you can tell that the site, even in 1939, is not uh, um, unaffected by uh, land use. 
And then uh, drilling down a little bit more, here's a map of habitat types that the biologists have put together. And it's nice because it kind of distills the site a little bit further. So uh, the dark green is the areas that, that, that kind of the quarter of the site that I mentioned earlier that really didn't get affected too much by the golf course. So those are existing annual grasslands, uh, uh, fairly untouched from uh, the, the 15, 20 years of the golf course. The lighter yellow color that's most of the course, uh, you probably guessed, is that's pretty much the footprint of the golf course. So that area now is disturbed landscape. Uh, I'll get into a little bit more. The vegetation is certainly weedy, as Eddie mentioned, and it's kind of in a transition phase uh, uh, to, to um, convert from what was grassland to then became golf turf and now is becoming something else. Uh, and then the gray area just certainly highlights where there's existing paved surfaces. So uh, in the lower right, you can see the parking area, and then you can see the existing golf cart paths, which are still there on site. And then finally, at the top of the image, uh, that's actually the, the lowest part of the site. That's where the water flows to. Uh, and you can see a bunch of different colors. You see blues, oranges. If you're really careful, you can see some purples. Those are all mapped wetland or water aquatic features on site. And so that's that's the bottom of the site, uh, and there uh, is, is wetland features down there already existing. Part of the assessment then was to explore the soil conditions, uh, and we dug a number of test pits throughout the site. This is from our exploration, uh, and we really want to understand how the site uh, soil structure was affected by the past use, specifically the golf course and the composition of the soil. Um, and and we did you know. This resulted in us understanding, yes, the golf course certainly affected the fertility of the soil by amendments and changes to make it a fertile golf course, uh, and also the soil structure and how, this, how water moves the site and nutrients move the site. Um, but even with all uh, of those impacts, uh, it's definitely a site that still can be restored for grassland uh, and uh, for other habitat features, which I will get into a little more. Here's a map of the soils. Uh, so again, the bottom of the site is at the top of the page. Uh, the purple and the blue colors are two different types of clay, Altamont and Rincon clay soils. Um, they uh, are being clay so soils, hold more water and have a tendency to support wetlands. Um, you'll probably have realized that is where existing wetlands exist. So there's a correlation there. Uh, and then the majority of the site is this green uh, color, and that is this Briona san sandy loam. So most of the site, the uplands in particular, and the drainage is this Briona sandy loam, which uh, as, as we start thinking about the future of the site, this is um, an important thing to understand is how erosive this soil can be. So this is um, just a photo from a textbook of the same soil series nearby in Contra Costa County. Uh, and uh, this is something we need to consider. And uh, it's something that frankly concerns me knowing what the site is, was like, what it's like today, uh, the number of drainages, which I'll explain a little bit more. Um, the, the one takeaway here is that there, if we were to simply allow the site to, to be what it is without maintaining it, we'd probably see a lot of areas that look like this in short order. Uh, so there's, there's some work we have to do to make sure that we don't go this direction. Um, thankfully, there's, um, there's lots of options we have to do that, but it's good to know this is what we're uh, potentially dealing with on site. And then Eddie talked about the invasive weeds um, and he, he covered most of it. It's uh, one thing to kind of point out, I think again, is that without the efforts of the Habitat Conservancy working on this right away, the site would look very different than it does now. Uh, and they've been working hard to remove thistle uh, in particular. And, uh, and you know, thankfully they have been working on that because if, if they hadn't, there'd be uh, fields of thistle, which certainly are not gonna help us for restoration uh, standpoint. And for public access, uh, it would also be detrimental. So um, it's, a, it's an ongoing effort. Uh, but it's something that will uh, hopefully reduce over time as, as the site transitions into a more stable, uh, restored grassland. Yeah. That's um, uh, really, at, we're at this stage since it was just a golf course recently, uh, we were waiting and working with the site to transition it over to more of a grassland habitat. And then uh, a little bit about habitat. So Nomad Ecology is one of our partners in this project and they've worked all around the region uh, and they've did assessments on the site and they found 
uh, one special status plant species on site and uh, 35 different wildlife species that have the potential to occur on site. Uh, and really what this tells us is the site definitely has the potential to provide meaningful habitat uh, for these sensitive species. So that's, that's pretty exciting. And if you can go back and remember Eddie's one of his first pictures he showed us was the context of the site around all the other land that's actively being preserved. Um, that's very helpful for a lot of these species. Um, so it's as a as a as one part of a bigger um, network of preserved lands. It's um, it's very valuable uh, from that standpoint, which is exciting. So let me transition a little bit more to more of this idea of zones. So I kind of mentioned this at the beginning of my talk is that you know we did this assessment work and then that kind of led us to thinking about the site as these uh, different having different zones. So the lower right, what we're calling was the park entry zone. So that's of course where the existing staging area is and large parking lot. Um, it's where it makes sense. It's already where people enter the site. It makes sense that that would stay the place that people enter the site. Uh, so we're looking at that as this park entry zone and thinking about it in those terms. Um, and then we have other two other zones, the blue kind of fingers you see that are on the site, those, that's the wetland and drainage zone. So what they're doing is, um, they're following existing drainages on site. Uh, and then at the bottom of the site, we have again, the series of wetlands. So that, that area, uh, really thinking about it as um, kind of a water centric and, and wetland centric zone based on just the topography and what the site is telling us from our assessment work. <clears throat> and then uh, finally, uh, the third zone is this upland restoration and trail zone. And that really is the majority of the site. Uh, on, on here, and I'll, I'll get into more details of, the, uh, of that zone here uh, momentarily. So let's look at the park entry zone a little bit more. Uh, this is an aerial that shows you the existing parking lot. Um, clearly, it's is a suitable spot for a staging area. It's very rare that a new park would open and they have a facility that's built uh, like this. Uh, it's, um, there's a lot of compatible uh, use between uh, use as a golf course parking lot and then a future staging area. So uh, we're all thankful for that. Um, and it's, it's of a scale and a size that not only would this work uh, uh, as a trailhead for the internal trails that we're really going to be planning for as part of this project, but there's been acknowledgement that this is one day going to be part of a much larger preserve, and so there will be future kind of regional trail connections, and uh, this is uh, seen as potentially a, one of the main staging areas to reach that in the future. Of course, with the golf course, there is existing infrastructure. Um, part of our investigations is to understand what condition it's in, what's still there, how is it operating. Um, and a couple of takeaways from that is that there's an existing septic system up here at the park entry zone, as well as a well. Uh, both of those appear to be suitable to not only support a restroom at this location, um, but also provide drinking water, which uh, we all know in the summertime will be really nice to have. So with some modifications, uh, that should be uh, relatively feasible, which is great. So let's switch over to the wetland and drainage zone. Um, and this zone, like I mentioned at the beginning, to focus on restoration. And then in a way, a lot of it is this larger land management concern over slope stability, where I mentioned that a lot of these upper soils are uh, quite unstable. Uh, you can see here in the blue, these fingers, uh, again, are conveying water um, or did historically, and they've been modified, which I'll get into here shortly. Um, but again, just, just to orient folks, maybe it wasn't completely clear that uh, the water is flowing basically from the bottom of the sheet to the top. So there's a ridge, it's north facing, uh, and water is ending up down where you can see the word ponds in different locations and basins. So those are different, different wetland features we've cataloged and keeping track of. And then uh, kind of the inverse of that is when you look at the drainages, they all drain into seven different uh, uh, drainage uh, areas. Uh, each one is quite unique. And as we move forward with the design and we think about public access and habitat, each one of these drainages is really its own unique um, situation. So they'll be evaluated individually as we move forward. And then I mentioned the drainage network. Um, one of the highlights is that there's, we've calculated that there's at least 10 miles of subsurface drainage that was installed to make the golf course work and playable year round. Clearly, they're moving a lot of water on the site to irrigate. Uh, there's a, um, years and years of, uh, of uh, science and work to make golf courses work efficiently. And when this golf course was put in, they, they did it um, you know, the traditional way. And there's 
a lot of drainage uh, infrastructure on site. And we're not going to go over this entire di diagram, thankfully, but what it does show you is what that network looks like. Um, there are there's drain pipes everywhere, and you don't see them unless you're really looking for them, but it's still there on site. They're still conveying water. Uh, and uh, one of the other kind of interesting points is how much the site was affected in terms of how water moves to the site is that these thicker blue areas you see, those are really the only remnant areas on site that still convey water on the surface during or after a rainstorm. So most of the water is, is collected into, to drain inlets into pipes, moving downstream into significantly bigger pipes as you get downstream, and then they, get, uh, they end up being in some of the ponds or the basins themselves. Uh, and relatedly, with that grading work, we also did analysis to look, well, what does the drainages, all the drainages look like? And the takeaway here is that anytime you see a red line, that's an area where the existing drainage has been over steepened and, and because of that destabilized with these type of soils. So I had kind of mentioned if we walked away and didn't do anything, um, this analysis is showing us it wouldn't be a, a pretty uh, situation in the future. There'd be a lot of erosion, a lot of sediment moving down uh, the site. And then finally, uh, during construction of the golf course, uh, there were four, uh, three or four ponds added um, and a number of six water quality basins. Uh, each one of those uh, uh, has an opportunity to be naturalized uh, and then certainly make more attractive than potentially what's out there now and also provide better habitat. So we're, this year we've been looking uh, at the hydrology uh, of the site and, and gathering more information uh, based on how, how the site is handling uh, this year's rainfall. The other point I'll make on this slide actually too is that these, these ponds, specifically the one we're looking at here, really was installed for irrigation to support the irrigation system on the golf course. And now that that irrigation system has been abandoned um, before even the Conservancy um, and the Park District took over ownership, uh, the hydrology of these ponds is quite different than it was historically. Uh, or by historically, I mean different than it was when the golf course was operating. Okay, so uh, the last zone I'll talk about here is this restoration and trail zone, which again is the majority of the site. Uh, and there's almost six miles of existing car paths on site that still exist. Uh, the greens and sand traps and fairways, they're all still there on site today. Uh, and they, as I mentioned, the irrigation system is still there. Uh, it doesn't operate, but it is still there. So let's look a little bit uh, again at this map. Um, so uh, the kind of lighter green color or almost no shading is the upland and restoration and trail zone. Um, and part of our assessment work was, you know, looking at the site and understanding opportunities for views and for different special areas. Uh, a couple of takeaways is that there's definitely the trails and the car paths themselves are a great start for um, inspiring where the trails could go. Um, and uh, we've also identified different views. You can see with the black arrows, they're pointing more or less to the north. So in different locations, you have a slightly different territorial view looking towards Antioch, the Delta on clear days. You can definitely see the Sierras. And then the other uh, thing we did is we analyzed where we could actually see my, Mount Diablo on site. So the, the shading you see there that's a little bit darker, looks like a shadow, is actually little circles. That is where the locations on site that we have analyzed that you can see Mount Diablo. So interesting enough, most of the site you can't see Diablo. You can at the park entry, some of these viewpoints you can. And it's just, um, it'll, be, uh, it'll be interesting as you move through the site. One of the themes we've kind of realized as we've walked the site over the past year is that it's a very, it's a varied experience uh, and you don't see everything. You don't see the entire site all from one location. You have to keep moving through the site to, to get a different view. And that makes for interesting uh, trails and it makes for an interesting experience on site. So the opportunity to have nice trails is, for the site is, is really uh, exciting. So uh, again, 5.9 of miles of trail, um, uh, sorry, of car paths. Um, they're all concrete and they're in fair to good condition. And they're certainly not perfect. You saw a lot of photos of weeds growing in and uh, East Bay Parks is doing a good job and Habitat Conservancy of, of tackling that and maintaining them. Um, but one thing to kind of point out is these were obviously put in to navigate uh, uh, a golf cart for golf purposes. So if we were to go in today and design trails, they certainly wouldn't follow the route that the golf cart trails are. 
Um, but uh, that's not to say there uh, they're not uh, great, uh, there's not great opportunities there because certainly some of these sections of these golf cart trails are actually quite excellent uh, and nice to walk on. So part of the next phase is to be looking at uh, what are the opportunities? How do people want to use the site for um, potentially multi-use trails? Uh, how, where are we going to go? Are they going to be small loops? Are they going to be long loops A combination of the two? Uh, and then again, the long term, uh, it's not part of this project now, but at some point there'll be future connections and thinking about, okay, well, how is this site going to be used when, when we can actually hike to Black Diamond Mines from here and, and far off in the future? So part of this analysis also was to look at how steep these existing golf cart paths are, because part, we definitely want some of these trails to be accessible to a wide range of users. And as, as most folks on the call are probably aware, that definitely the, the steepness and the slope of a trail uh, impact uh, how accessible these trails are. So part of our assessment was just to go through and highlight steep trails. So the red is um, was quite steep. Uh, the orange is uh, fairly steep. So again, implications here for accessibility, uh, if we're gonna to try to make a ADA compliant trail or something similar, um, you know, where, are we gonna, where are we gonna have to make modifications to the golf cart pads if we were to just adopt them as closely as possible. Um, and then also, uh, these also impact kind of long-term sustainability of trails. So I mentioned that these trails probably are not the way we lay them out. Um, that's not only for trail experience, uh, uh, reasons, but also for long-term sustainability of the trails. All right. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to actually go back and do a quick site tour because I think now that we've kind of dumped a lot of information on the on you, I think it's good to kind of now take a quick tour around the site um, and you can kind of get a sense of maybe what it feels like a little bit more to be on site because I know I think most folks have yet to be on site and I think uh, it's fair to say that uh, for those who have been on site, it's been uh, there's only a few of you who've been on the site since uh, the golf course had closed. I think one person in the chat had mentioned uh, they were able to get on a docent led tour, which is excellent. Hopefully, more of you have been able to do that too. So here we are at the uh, at the existing uh, parking lot, which will become the future staging area. Right now, we're looking back uh, towards Oakley Brentwood uh, direction. But if we turn around in the next slide and we look west. Uh, we can start look out over the site. Um, and then walking a little bit further, uh, there uh, is an existing deck for the old clubhouse uh, that was at the golf course that still remains. Um, and there are a number of these uh, different elements that are still on site um, in different, not decks necessarily, but different infrastructure pieces that remain from the golf course. And then moving out on site a little bit further, uh, you kind of get a sense of really the beauty of the site. Uh, if you look closely, you can tell it was a golf course. There are still, there's evidence of sand traps. They're still there. The topography really is not, um, uh, it's not simple. It's, you know, there's undulations, there's different drainages. And again, like I mentioned earlier, there's not one spot where you can take an entire site. If you want to see the Roddy Ranch golf course, you need to experience it and move through the site. And again, with the idea, um, is with multi-use trails, it can be uh, uh, potentially access, you know, bicycle, equestrian, uh, and, and hiking through the site. So how do these users use the site? Uh, is something we'll certainly be looking into and getting feedback from the folks on this call will be very exciting. And then understanding how, how do we apply that in the site, knowing what we know about the site today. Uh, I can say one thing though, having been on the site that the trails experience are definitely gonna be nice on the site. Uh, and again, progressing uh, this idea of almost unfolding views. So you move along even just 200 yards and you have a different view uh, and, and the trails, um, in this case, cart paths, um, often create a nice experience. And as you head all the way to the far west end of the site, um, this is what you would see. So you'll see the hills in the background close to Black Diamond Mines. The very foreground is the existing grasslands I've talked about that were more or less preserved when the golf course went in. And then this photo is interesting because you can see the, the lower part where it's kind of the modeled uh, varied vegetation. That's an old fairway that is again in this kind of awkward stage of transitioning from was once grassland, became uh, turf, and now is moving back to uh, uh, a grassland. And so there's active restoration occurring now to figure out the most efficient way to, to return this to to um, grassland. And then, you know, this image I'll mention too is a good one to look at the 
golf cart path. So you can kind of see it winding down the hill. Works really well for a golf cart. Uh, and I can speak for myself here, maybe a few others in the call, that if this was me and I was hiking this or biking this, um, I'd be hard pressed not to cut that uh, corner. And that, that's, that happens a lot. That's human nature. Um, so it's trails like that that we think about. We, don't, we certainly don't want that. We don't want six or seven routes going through a site. Um, there's, it affects drainage. It affects our user experience. So this is just an example I thought I'd bring up here of where uh, there's definitely areas where golf cart paths are great, the good start, but they're certainly um, will be problematic if they just get endorsed um, um, just blankly. Again, another example, uh, clearly made for golf carts, probably not the best uh, uh, user experience. Um, so we'll be looking at areas like this as we get into some of the different options for public access. Again, different location of the site, different view. Uh, you know, looking out further in the background, um, lower, more territorial views of the area. It's just a beautiful site. And then again, the foreground uh, evidence of uh, historic uh, erosion that um, probably uh, happened, you know, decades ago, if not longer. More infrastructure still there. And then the ponds, I talked about this a little bit uh, earlier, but again, uh, you know, frankly, they're not terribly attractive in the current condition or, or beneficial to wildlife, uh, but our assessment has definitely shown that that can change. So there's exciting things we can, we can do to modify these to make them more exciting uh, and functional for habitat. And then here we are back at the park entry zone. This is a view of the driving range. Uh, and I like this shot because it reinforces the idea that, you know, the golf course and the impact of the golf course is still there and it's widespread. The whole site was graded to be a golf course. Uh, and uh, if you look closely, you can see hints of that. Um, and so uh, it's kind of just, in a way, it's a neat layer to the, to the site. So with that, that ends the tour. So Eddie, um, I'm going to turn over to you. Here are the, uh, here's your slide. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so you can see there is a lot to this site, sort of tightly wrapped into 230 acres, a lot of stuff underground, some stuff at the surface that we have to consider. So um, it, we're, we're going to go through, continue through the planning process. So these are some of our next steps and milestones that we hope to reach uh, throughout the year. So we've just posted our existing conditions report online. Uh, some of you may have already seen that on the Roddy Ranch uh, project webpage, and we'll have a slide for that um, coming up soon. So you can, uh, you can check that out, all the, the detail and maps and figures. Uh, we're doing our first public meeting now. The next step is to draft some alternatives, and we're looking for uh, to do that sometime in May, and that will be um, available for public viewing, uh, a chance for the public to weigh in on um, draft alternative plans for the former golf course. Public meeting number two, late spring, early summer, and we're going to take um, feedback and consider things and narrow that down to a preferred alternative in the summer, um, continue with environmental review, have another public meeting in the fall, and hopefully if everything goes to plan and um, runs smoothly, we'll have a final plan adoption by this time next year, early, late 2021, early 2022. So this is a run through of um, what we've got planned out, um, you know, subject to change by a week or two, depending on how information is coming through. But this is our general plan moving forward. And the public meetings are a way to get involved, contacting us directly. Um, we're considering, of course, we have to consider um, COVID restrictions moving forward, but having some sort of site visit coming up. Um, we're just starting to discuss some, um, some thoughts on that, so stay tuned. Uh, let's go to the next slide. All right, so this is a chance. Um, for you to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we've got a few questions for the audience just to see what your thoughts are. So we'll start off uh, with the first question for the chat box, which is, are you interested in volunteer opportunities for habitat restoration? You can answer yes, no, maybe, or some other answer. So if folks wanna um, chime in, that'd be great. I'm seeing some yeses, some maybes, some more yeses. Okay, great. 
Okay, so maybes, yes. All right. Now, um, the next question is, let's go to the next slide, Eric. All right, this is a more open-ended question. And that is, what stories about the park would you like to learn more about? Some examples could be, you'd like to learn more about um, the ranching history, um, about Native American heritage of the area, um, about the wildlife habitat restoration. So this is an open-ended question. Um, what, what stories, general stories, would you like to learn more about? And this can help us get an idea of uh, your interest in um, how, how we can sort of steer the messaging at the park moving forward. All right, so I'm seeing uh, ranching, wildlife, Native American history, habitat restoration, cultural history. Uh, the rattlesnake population, I'm, I'm sure we could, we could go at great lengths to discuss rattlesnakes there. Uh, natural history, the, the legacy of the Roddies, um, Native American heritage. All right, great responses. And our final chat question for the group, uh, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, this is a fill in the blank opportunity. So fill in the blank. What excites me most about this future park is it provides an opportunity to, and you fill in the blank. So examples could be provides an opportunity to uh, go bird watching an opportunity to um, breathe fresh air, to exercise, um, to bike, to um, look for wildlife, to volunteer. So let's, let's hear some responses from folks. Um, to build horse trails, uh, to hike in your backyard, uh, wheelchair access, potential to connect to Black Diamond, um, hiking photography and lots of biking, riding horses, enjoying the outdoors, bike closer to homes, or closer to home, rather, uh, additional cycling linkages in, in East County, trail running. All right, this, this is wonderful. Um, so folks, feel free to um, add more comments um, in the chat box. We're going to, um, let's see what the next slide is. I think this might be our last slide, Eric. Oh, okay, so here's here's uh, my contact info. This is the last slide. So um, I can be reached uh, via phone or email. I'm at ewillis at evparks.org. Our project webpage is evparks.org slash about slash planning slash Roddy Ranch. And um, for information in Spanish, if you want to reach out to Elena, uh, her email address is there, Elena, at visionhispanausa.com. All right, so um, yeah, Eric, I think we can pull down the presentation at this point. Thank you, folks. Um, you probably learned a lot more about erosion and drains than you ever thought possible tonight. Um, thank you all for, for listening to our talk. Um, at this point, we can open up for more formal questions from the audience or People have a comment that they'd like to make. So um, at the bottom of your screen, if you click participants, uh, there's a raise the hand function. And um, AirDem is going to uh, call out who has their hand up. But I see our, our director, Colin Coffey, has his hand up. So I'm going to, sorry if hey, we're, we're cutting anyone off here, but go ahead, Colin. Eddie, just uh, slightly after I did some public official introductions at the beginning of the session, I noticed that my colleague, uh, Beverly Lane, uh, has uh, uh, joined us and is attending. And I wanted our participants to know that uh, Beverly is a longtime member of the uh, board of the East Bay Regional Park District, representing Ward 6. Hi, Beverly. Welcome. All right. Hey, Eddie, so, uh, Amelia so Marshall has a question. OK, go ahead if you want to unmute yourself and if uh, you can share your video too, if you'd like. Thank you. Hello. Good evening, everyone. My name is Amelia Marshall. I'm a longtime Park District volunteer on the 
volunteer trail safety patrol and other functions and currently serving as an equestrian advocate on the trail users working group that's advising the planning department on future parkland development. I wanted to talk a little bit about Jack Roddy's legacy. Uh, according to his official biography, one of the reasons why Mr. Roddy has uh, sold the property to the park district instead of getting rich by selling it to a housing developer is he wants to have an opportunity for the youth of the area to learn about traditional ranching life. And of course, fundamental to traditional ranching life is horseback riding. So right now there is a tremendous uh, interest in horseback riding and equestrian sports uh, on the part of communities of color as well as uh, you know white people and we have a great opportunity now to uh, do long range planning for an equestrian center it's not clear from the materials the park district has made available what the uh, geographic relationship is between the golf course that we're talking about tonight and uh, Mr. Roddy's uh, house and his horse barn, but clearly there's some connection and we can get the trails right initially by long range planning. Uh, right now we have uh, also a high degree of popularity in bicycle riding and with the pandemic we're seeing huge uh, increases in visitorship in parks. So uh, if we are going with an idea of using narrow multi-use trails, that could be really problematic because horses and bikes don't mix on trails. Uh, we're finding with the trail users working group that we're having to think a little outside the box and think about how we can have safe trail opportunities for everyone. So I'm hoping that the planners and their wisdom will think hard about how to get the trails so that you have bike free trails for beginning equestrians to learn to ride safely without having their horses spooked by bikes. And of course, concrete paths are ill suited to uh, the delicate hooves that horses go on. You need to have unpaved trails for that. So those are my observations. I certainly am excited that Roddy Ranch will be open and I would love to see us honor Mr. Roddy's legacy by providing an equestrian center for the area's youth. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. We really appreciate those comments. So we're, we're still in the initial planning phases and we're gonna look hard at uh, which trails are appropriate for which use. Um, we tend to want to be um, available for all users to use all trails. That's not always possible, but we're going to have to look long and hard. And when we get to the alternative uh, drafts phase, uh, we may have some of those options laid out and we'll allow the public to weigh in on uh, what, what would be best suited for the site. Okay, um, Erdem, did we have any other questions or comments? Any hands? Yes, raised? we've got two more. Our next question comes from Owen S. Okay, Owen, um, if you want to go ahead and unmute, you're welcome to share your screen. Thank you. Hi, how's it going? Um, so I just want to say thank you so much uh, on behalf of some of the youth uh, from Brentwood, speaking for some of them, that uh, hiking, photography, biking, stuff like that has been uh, uh, st something to do out in this crazy, crazy world that we're living in right now. So uh, just want to say on behalf of all of us, thank you for just allowing this open space to be such a great place for some of that. But then also another question on the map that Mr. Stromberg uh, shared with us. Um, there was a label for a uh, water pump station. Um, could there be more like explanation on what that would be, what it'd be used for, who would operate it? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's the a former water pump from the golf course, but maybe Eric, if you're on the line. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. here. Let me uh, get my video on so you can see me. Um, you have the eagle eyes, Owen. Good job. Um, so uh, the, the there is an existing pump station at the very bottom of the site near the irrigation ponds. And that was basically to pump water up through the golf course. So very briefly, the water came in from a line um, along Balfour Road and down lower into that pump station and that pumped up so it's not necessarily a, like a uh, it's and it's also non-potable water so in terms of water
water resource for drinking, which is maybe what you're getting at. That's um, not appropriate there. It's also a huge, it's a, an industrial size pump. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I, I just wanted to do a time check with folks. It is 7.30, um, we have this recorded. So if anyone needed to log out, um, that more than fine, uh, we take no offense to it, but we're gonna stay on uh, for as long, you know, a while longer to, to get through questions and comments. So um, Erdem, if we have um, any other comments or questions, we can take that. Yes, we have one more question from Jim Hansen. Okay, Jim, you're on. There we go. Great. Well, first of all, um, thank you, Eddie, and, and thank you, Eric, for really informative um, visuals and kind of getting the layout of the site. And just wanted to know, I'm with the Volunteer of California Plant Society, East Bay, and it was really good to see the early weed work that you're doing. These, the, these areas do uh, get carried away, as you know, with star thistle and a lot of other things that make the site really uh, difficult for both people and other living things. So um, hats off for doing that. Um, and I just had a quick question. Maybe it's too early in the process in terms of your uh, kind of vegetation management, but um, have you, are you, are you thinking of, do, it looks like you mentioned native grassland restoration, at least part of it or some areas. Have you gotten into some thoughts about that or is this too, a little too early in the process? Thanks. Yeah, good, good question. So we do have thoughts, but it is still very early in the process. In fact, that's kind of the next thing on my plate is to start thinking about the restoration opportunities on site. I've been waiting because I'm doing that work as well as the drainage work at the same time. So I'm waiting for whatever winter we have to kind of finish up. Um, but it hasn't stopped us from thinking about it. And so we have a few other experts who are chiming in, um, especially looking at the soil side of things. So right now, preliminarily, uh, you know, the, the, at least we're looking to get back to what the grasslands were before the golf course, but they're mainly annual grasslands, nothing too exciting. Um, but there's hope and we are, uh, the Habitat Conservancy is already working and trying a few different things of drill seeding of, or out there right now uh, to see if we can actually get some, if we can raise the bar a little bit on restoration for the, the grasslands. So we don't know yet what, we can achieve, um, but we're hoping it can be, at the very least, it'll be what's out there before the golf course. And ideally we can do better. Um, we don't know yet. Great. Much better. And just real quick follow-up. Um, are you looking at a little bit of oak wood? It looks like it gets pretty warm there and some arroyos of arroyo willow or? So what well, I, I was, I didn't hear the first question. Did you say oak woodland? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, um, Potentially, it's an interesting, you know, the, the the maps that I showed you kind of clipped to just Roddy Ranch, but if you, if I were to have zoomed out a little bit and showed you twice the area, Oak Woodland is just to the west on that same ridge. Mm -hmm. So, and you look back, that 39 aerial is fantastic because you get a sense of what was there before. And it, uh, interestingly enough, didn't show Oak in 1939. So we're not convinced that necessarily that would be what it is. However, uh, during our soil analysis, there was definitely, there's some oaks that are out there now that were pre-existed the golf course, the golf course planted trees. Some of them aren't doing too well, but a lot of them are doing well. Um, so it's a long-winded way of saying that there's probably a little bit of a mix. I don't think it would ever get mapped as oak woodland, but there would, yeah, be, right. there would be oak trees. And then for arroyo willow, um, there's an interesting stand of arroyo willow on site now um, in one of the drainages. Uh, and so, um, uh, there's potential that that could be expanded or, or that could be used as a reference for other locations. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Erdem, any other raised hands, uh, folks? Yeah, we've got two more. The first one is from Richard Bangert. Okay, we'll, we'll go with um, Richard and then Beverly, I saw um, your hand was up as well. So Richard, uh, go ahead. Yes, uh, my, my question is about the, um, Water features, uh, you mentioned that one uh, pond, uh, right now it's kind of sketchy, but you might be able to do something with it. Uh, 
my thought is I, I would encourage you to find a way to do something with it because uh, I mean, it may not be a natural pond, but neither are countless watering holes for cattle that are created so that cattle can uh, have a place to drink. And we've heard about how they, there's a mini habitat created around those watering holes. I understand, you know, frogs and other species live around there. Uh, I mean, you could say it's unnatural, but uh, you know, the trails we're cutting through there are unnatural too. I mean, why, why couldn't we uh, go out of our way to add some more ponds and water features uh, to the landscape? And I, I guess I gathered from skimming through the, the, the existing condition, yes, there, there are water lines that go every which way, but they're not in great shape. So that may not be an option for getting water to a water pond to yeah. make it viable. Anyway, yeah, it's a good, good question. Um, so <clears throat> as I mentioned, the ponds were basically a, uh, a result of the irrigation being water being brought in a non-potable line. Uh, and that line is still there um, for the most part. Um, the distribution lines throughout the site are a little bit suspect. Uh, but the issue, one issue we've run into is that there is a requirement that that, and somebody else could correct me with the nuances here, but my course understanding is there's a requirement that non-potable water cannot be used for wildlife purposes in its own right. Um, so to some degree, what I just said is accurate. I don't quote me on exactly the details because that's not my expertise, but that's what my understanding. Um, so there's that we're working with. So I think really, Richard, what we're trying to do is saying, okay, if that water is off the table, then what can we do? Because I think we're after kind of the same thing as a variety of, uh, of habitats and water features that persist longer. Like you mentioned, stock ponds, for instance, are, are great for wildlife and, um, and for cattle. Uh, and there's some nearby in Horse Valley and other areas that are performing that function as well. So part of what we're doing this winter, although, you know, granted this winter hasn't turned out to be great, is we're trying to understand what could we actually get to persist naturally. And it appears that we can probably not get our perennial pond in most years. Maybe some really wet years would be perennial. But it looks like, uh, you know, we can get some pretty persistent ponds that will last, for, you know, last month or two in the summer on a good year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Beverly, um, you, I think, had your hand up. And folks, Beverly is one of our um, board members. If you want to go ahead, Beverly. Yeah, thank you. Um, I um, represent part mm -hmm. of East County in that um, Round Valley is part of my ward and the Vasco Caves are as well. Um, so I'm always very interested in, in how the, uh, how our uh, public hearings go with these proposed land use plans, and, and I, I really appreciate the program tonight. Um, I do want to make two comments that I hope people will realize, and one is um, that with this property, we are, we again have um, our valued uh, partnership with the Habitat Conservancy, and what happens with those partnerships is um, partnering in acquisition, but in partnering in how the park ends up being operated. So there's restoration and there's public access. And what the park district needs to do with each of these is work on the balance between those two things. So having the, having the public meetings is very helpful for us to hear um, people's opinions on it. And then my second thing is I, I do want you all to value um, the fact that the planning for the Roddy Golf Course is for the Park District moving with the speed of light. And um, so just to let you know that, um, you know, your director, Colin Coffey, and me supporting, um, are moving quickly to see how we can open this property up so that people can appreciate it um, and that it is happening in a way that's uh, pretty speedy for the park district. So thanks for the program tonight and for letting me give these two reminders. 
Thank you so much, Beverly. Um, it looks like uh, Josh, if you want to go ahead at this point and unmute yourself, and you're welcome to share video as well. Hey, Kim. Are, are you able to hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. So um, first of all, I want to say thank you for putting off putting on a tremendous presentation. I think that the information that you've shared is is awesome. And um, thank you to all the people who contributed to this because I think you've done a great job. Um, my question is not as much about the park as it is about connecting to the park because I live nearby. And one of the things about this location that makes me nervous is the fact that the two roads that are most likely to be used by the people who are coming to that location are both roads that are not particularly friendly to people who are traveling um, except in a car. And if one of the ways that we want to encourage people to use our parks is getting there without using a car, um, both the last, you know, let's say quarter mile of Balfour Road and also that entire section of Deer Valley um, are really dangerous places for people to be on bicycles. And so I'm just wondering if there's any communication taking place between uh, East Bay Regional Parks and either City of Antioch or County or State about possibly finding a way to make those roads a little bit safer, especially the, the Balfour access, which is probably gonna bring in a lot of the traffic, I would guess, there's not that much of the road that would need to be improved to make it much safer for people to get to the park. And so I'm just offering that as a thought. Thanks again. Great job. You guys are awesome. Love, love, love East Bay Regional Parks. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Josh. We have had some preliminary discussions with the city of Antioch, Antioch leaders and elected officials, and um, have, have uh, pointed out some of those concerns. And I, I hear those concerns as well. So that, that portion um, is within the city of Antioch. I think part of it is, is, uh, is unincorporated Contra Costa. Um, we might have somebody else on the call who can better dive into that. I don't know, if, Devin, if you're available or Brian Holt, but um, I can leave it at just generally, we've, uh, we've been in preliminary discussions with the city of Antioch about that. Uh, Colin, yeah. Yeah, you know, that, that triggers my thought because I've had discussions with uh, you, Eddie, and I know Brian, and our, our planners generally, as I look at these preliminary uh, ideas, it just strikes me as imperative that at some point, uh, and I, I think I've been told the, the planning's there, it's the timing that's more of an issue, but at some point we have to have access to Empire Mine Road. In, into this part. I mean, it's surrounded by Horse Valley. And of course, I think we just spent a million dollars uh, or, or the Habitat did in, in, in our partnership on uh, restoration efforts in Horse Valley. Um, and, and there is an obvious need, as obvious need of access to the currently land bank star mine trail that uh, extends from Empire Mine Road into Black Diamond. So this, this property abuts Empire Mine Road. It's, uh, it could be an access point for uh, bicyclists and pedestrians, as our speakers uh, have, have mentioned, that want to avoid Deer Valley or uh, Balfour. Um, I, I'm a frequent user of Empire Mine uh, Road as a, as a hiker. Uh, it, it just would seem a natural fit for operation of this uh, golf course property uh, to have it connect with, with that uh, with, with Empire Mine Road. Yes, thank you, Colin. And we are looking at potential connections and we're not sure what um, use Empire Mine Road will have in the future. It's currently uh, temporarily closed by the city, but um, you know, we, we don't know in the future if, that, if it's gonna reopen or it's gonna stay in uh, temporary uh, condition for a while longer. So um, that, that's a good observation, yes. Uh, but as it is, uh, Empire Mine Road is sort of informally used as, as a biking and hiking trail today and goes right at the north end of, of the Roddy Ranch site. Okay, um, were there any other audience questions? It doesn't look like there are any raised hands. A 
All right. Everyone's so quiet. Of course, everyone's got their microphones muted. Oh, we got one more question, Eddie. Okay. Just came up uh, from Gwen Daly. Okay, I see that. Yes, Gwen, go ahead. Okay, so um, I just had a quick question. How does the Roddy Ranch golf course area, how is that going to relate to the rest of the park? What is the vision for that for the future? So it, we, we think it's gonna, we anticipate that it could be one of the major staging areas for the habitat conservation preserve lands. Um, so a little bit of background on that is with, with habitat preservation land, we're restricted on how much new development we can put in. I believe over the entire 14,000 plus acres, we can only do about 50 acres of new development. So that's putting in staging areas, picnic sites, new trails. So for example, if we build a six foot wide trail that's 200 feet long, we have to calculate how many acres that is. And that, that counts against that total. So we have to be, um, smart with the decisions that go into that. So we anticipate at sort of the 35,000 foot level that Roddy Ranch could serve as a, a major staging area into the larger Deer Valley Regional Preserve that's still several years out in planning. Um, so to start, it'll be self-contained, but we're looking at connections um, to other existing parks like Black Diamond to the north, the regional parks to the south and to the east. And that, that's where we are at, at this time. Uh, we don't have any specific plans for trails, but just generally we wanna make those connections. And Roddy Ranch seems like a good place um, to start with that. And because it's already been developed, um, there's a lot of opportunity there to open this area um, earlier than we might open up other parts of the preserve. Okay, thank you. Great. And, any of my colleagues out there, if they wanted to add um, some thoughts to that, you're, you're more than welcome to. All right. Well, uh, that might be the last question of the evening. So I wanna thank everybody for um, taking some time out of your evening. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world and we're, we're glad you chose to be here with us to learn more about this project and some of the initial planning phases or um, uh, uh, the initial planning that is. Uh, we, we have future phases that are coming and we will have more information posted to our project website as things come up. I know a lot of you are already on the interest list for this, but I'm gonna go ahead and put my email address in the chat box for everyone. And if I can't answer a question for you, I've got a lot of colleagues who can, but feel free to shoot me an email if you want to be on our list. Uh, we can let you know about any upcoming events at Roddy Ranch, how things are going. Um, be sure to check back on the website. And of course, when we have uh, future public meetings, we'll let the local news media know and, and post it for everyone. Uh, so I want to I want to thank you all for being here, and have a great rest of the evening. Thank you, Eddie. Okay, thanks, everyone. Thank you.